this morning to you all. So Carl is leading the service and communion as part of the service. Then this evening at 6 p.m. we're expecting a visit from <coughs> Charles to Lacey. Tuesday, 7 p.m. here, we've got a church meeting. Church business meeting. I've got some agendas here. Wait to be given out or or if you haven't got one on the electronics? They have been sent. Right, so I've got some hard copies if you need one. Friday, 6, oh, six sorry, Wednesday, 6 p.m. Boys Club, and then Friday, 6.30 p.m. Girls Club. And then next Saturday afternoon, if you remember, there's the Jack Jahal. Uh, ordination as a minister at Whitford, at the Whitford Church, 3 p.m. I think it, I think it is. The next Sunday, the 28th, in the morning, 10:30 a.m., we are expecting Donna, Mupalo, from Stanway. It'll be jam for the children, and in the evening, it'll be Paul Barnes. It'll be the last Sunday evening of the month. There will be refreshments after the service. <laughs> Streets for Prayer, Common Road, Conway Avenue, and Coronation Close. UEC Church to remember in prayer is the one at Crescent, the Brain Tree, and missionary focus this week is Barnabas A. So my wife sends her apologies, she's still not well. She's got more antibiotics and a steroid pump now. And the same earlier on, where she coughs so much in the night, it keeps her awake. I can forgive, forgive her for that. But I'm walking around in a trance this morning, thinking I've got to get ready for church. I've got everything ready. I'm standing outside at 20 to 10 thinking, why ain't no one here? <laughs> And then I will as we don't start till I'm past <laughs> So hopefully the service will go over. Okay. We're working with some scripture, and it's from John 4, verses 23 to 24. And it says, Yet a time is coming, and has now come, when a true worshipper will worship the Father in the spirit and in truth. <coughs> For they are the kind of worshippers the Father seek. God is spirit, and his worshippers must worship in the spirit and in the truth. And I hope that we are one of those worshippers. So this is open in prayer. Eternal God, you are our Lord. You are the firm foundation for everything we build. You give gifts to your people for the good of the church. You equip and train your people to carry out the good works you have prepared for us in advance. As we meet today, we ask that you provide wisdom, guidance and direction. Remind us that you are a loving ally. You are our fortress. You are our tower, our tower of strength, and you are our rescuer. Everything we need is found in you, through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. We have some more children. We will have our first hymn now. And it is the church's one foundation. Thank you. 
Especially in, as we meet by the sea, we have the Coast Guard and the RNI. They put their lives at risk daily so it can make it safe for us all. So we ask that you, you look down on those and give them the strength to keep on going all. We pray for our government and leaders. As you command us to do. We, plead, we pray for the wisdom that goes beyond natural political instincts. That our leaders govern with a better sense of justice. 
and pray for peace at this time in the Middle East. We ask that we will be able to make them sit down and listen to each other and come to an agreement where they can all live together in peace. And we mustn't forget the Ukraine, which is still an ongoing war. While everything else is happening, we seem to put them on a back burner. But there is still soldiers losing their lives out there. And families losing husbands and fathers. So we ask that you comfort those who have, who have lost in this war. And ask that the two leaders can come to a mutual agreement that they will both be able to live side by side. We pray for our community, Lord. We ask that we can reach out into our community and help those who need helping. And maybe they can come to our church, Lord, and hear your word. And our church will grow. And we will be able to take your word out into our streets, Lord. And pray for that. Whoever needs praying for. Prayer is a big part of the church, Lord, and we don't seem to pray too often. Many of us will go home and some of us won't even pray at all. Lord. So put on our heart that we need prayer in our life. And prayer will help the church grow. So we pray for our forthcoming meeting, Lord, on Tuesday, Lord, on how better to run our church the things that we can do for our church. So we ask that you, you put on our hearts that anyone who can have a service to this church will stand up and say, use me, Lord. Just as you've given everyone a gift, Lord. And we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. We have our third hymn, and it's called I'm Building a People of Power. For we are fellow workers in God's service. 
You are God's field, God's building. By the grace God has given me, I lay the foundation as a wise builder, and someone else is building on it. But each one should build with care, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. If anyone builds on this foundation using gold, silver, costly stones, wood, hay or straw, their work will be shown for what it is, because the day will bring it to light. It will be revealed with fire, and the fire will test the quality of each person's work. If what has been built survives, the builder will receive a, receive a reward. If it is burned up, the builder will suffer loss, but yet will be saved, even though only as one escaping through the flames. This is the word. <clears throat> In that bit of scripture there, it says, one waters, one plants. It's talking about the church and for that we need a balanced church. And that's what I want to talk to you today about. As we've got a church meeting to come up, I thought it was quite appropriate. Now the scripture for that comes from Acts. Acts 2, 41 to 47. And it says, Those who accepted his message were baptised, and about 3,000 were added to their number that day. They devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, and to fellowship, <coughs> to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. Everyone was filled with awe at the many wonders and signs performed by the apostles. All the believers were together. And everything in common, and had everything in common. They sold property and possessions to give to anyone who was in need. Every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts, praising God and enjoying the favour of all the people. And the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. If we trace the hand, if we trace God's hand back to the book of Genesis and follow it through the Old Testament, we will find God is the creator of two institutions. The first, the family, and second, the church. And we quickly realise that the two are very similar. They are similar in the way they are designed, and similar in what God expects from them. If we listen to these words, I am so glad I'm a part of the family of God. I've been washed in the fountain, cleansed by his blood, joint heirs with Jesus as we travel his soul. I am part of the family, the family of God. Has anyone heard them words before? What about you, Peter? No. It's from Bill Gaper's song. No. Now he wrote that song 50 years ago. But God began forming his forever family thousands of years ago. We don't know exactly how long ago. The Bible just says it happened in the beginning. We don't know how long he thought about it before he started. But we can trace his hand back all the way to these two institutions that he put in place for us. And that's what the scripture seems to tell us. He had in mind. The church is a family, and families are better when they stay together. You see, community matters. And this is why we need to remember that anything that matters to God, Satan wants to destroy. So he attacks the church. He attacks the family. So we must remember, and remember this, to keep in mind a couple of things that really matter. 
Families are better when they work together. Churches are better when they work together. Solomon said that one may be overpowered, but two can defend themselves. All of us need to know that someone has our back, can we? That someone is watching out for us. You can try and do it alone. You can work really hard at it. But you cannot live your life on your own. Every one of us has three basic needs. And they are, first, we all have a need for other people to walk with us. Life gets dangerous sometimes. It gets complicated. The path is not always clear. Often, in fact, usually, there are traps set for us. And they're set in many places. And that's what makes them a trap. So don't we always see them in time? We don't always see them in time. And if we have someone walking with us, they can help us navigate these difficult times. Number two, we all have a need for other people to work with us. Solomon said in Ecclesiastes 4.10, two are better than one. If either of them falls down, one can help the other up. We need people to work with us, don't we? I don't mean that in a literal sense as in a workplace, but it does help. I mean it as when we say, work with me on this. I need some support. I just need some help. And further, we need other people to watch out for us. Satan can throw a lot of us, throw a lot at us when we're going through hard spiritual times. It's nice to have someone help fight our battles with us. Paul said in Philippians 2, verses 3 to 4, do nothing out of self-ambition or conceit, but in humility consider others as more important than yourselves. Everyone should look out, not only for his own interests, but also for the interests of others. And I pray as a church that we can do this together that we will look out for each other. So this morning we, we come to the book of Acts chapter 2 and the Bible says that now God's people are being filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter stands up to preach and when he finishes, 3,000 people have given their lives to Jesus. And now the family of God begins to prosper and grow. They grow spiritually and they grow in numbers. They grow in relationships. But that growth is balanced. You see, if the church only grew in numbers and failed to grow spiritually as well, or failed to grow closer to one another, then the church would die. As so many have done. Church growth is more than just a numerical growth. It's not just about numbers. It's about having a balance. I read this passage many times while doing this sermon and it never seemed to grow old on me. There is something just exciting about seeing a great number of people coming to know the Lord all at one time. Over the last couple of years, Sharon and I have been to the Franklin Graham God Loves You Tour. And at the end, we have seen hundreds of people go forward and give their lives to the Lord. And it is amazing. So let's look at Acts 1, verse 15. We are told there were 120 people in the church. Then in Acts 2, there were suddenly 3,000. 
So in the next four, the number grows to over 5,000. And then we are reminded in the next two that every day the, the Lord added to their number of those who were being saved. One more thing. At this time, women or children were not included in the camp. So the actual number was greater than the 5,000. But one of the questions that always comes to mind is, with the church growing to 120, then to 3,000, <coughs> then to 5,000, we've always happening, in a, all this is happening in a few short weeks. How do you handle that many people? How do you keep them all? Well, the answer is a balance. Finding a balance within the church. The passage gives us at least four things to do to achieve balance in the church. And it's important to remember. Number one, a balanced church is a church where both unchurched and church people meet together. A balanced church must include those who know Christ and those who do not know Christ. Someone has said that the church is the only organisation in the world that actually exists for those who do not yet attend. We must never be satisfied with what we have. As long as there is one lost person in our community, we must reach out. Just as Jesus left the 99 to find the one. Some of the churches in our area are growing. But some of that growth takes place because some people simply move from one church to another. We see it all the time. But the church does not exist to swap sheep. Remember, we are here to reach the lost sheep. So the primary place where we try to reach these people is right here in this building at our worship service. You see, we want to be involved, want to involve everyone in worshipping God. Because that will be the main thing we do in heaven. And it must be the main thing we do now. If we're going to spend eternity together in heaven, worshipping Jesus, and we need to practice now. So the best thing we can do each week is to invite someone to church. Invite anyone you know who is not already at a church. Because we must grow together. We must worship together. Number two, I believe to achieve a balance in church churches must grow together and maybe we can do that through groups you see homes were small in that day but over 5,000 people were in church they certainly could not all meet in one place so they met in their homes maybe we need to do the same See, we have a Bible study and we have a few come to Bible study. Why not set up a Bible study in your home? Invite friends, family. It doesn't have to be a church congregation. Just your friends or family to come around and talk about the Lord. Open your homes to a group. Verse 42 tells us that they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They met every day to learn and grow. You see, when it comes to learning the complete teaching of God's Word, we will never arrive. We will never reach the point where we will say, I think I've got it now. I pretty much understand it all. You see, we simply cannot exhaust the teachings of God's Word. And that is why churches must learn together. 
Number three, to achieve a balance, churches must fellowship together. Verse 32, uh, verse 42 to 46 says, they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and to prayer. And 46 says, every day they continued to meet together in the temple courts. They broke bread in their homes and ate together with glad and sincere hearts. For me it's hard to say the word fellowship without picturing a group of people sitting down eating together. I think that's a way we can bring the people to the Lord. But the word is more than a verb, than a noun. The Greek word is kononia, and it refers to the bond that believers have. As believers, we share a connection that others do not. And because we do, we must spend time growing that relationship. It's just like a marriage. That relationship has to grow. Also, the church must pray together. Verse 42. It says, They develop themselves to the apostles' teaching and to fellowship, to the breaking of bread and prayer. Someone has said, The early church used to pray and fast. Today, we struggle just to pray. Church was started with a prayer. And as a result, churches have seen people healed because of prayer. Churches have seen people saved because of prayer. Churches have seen relationships mended because of prayer. Families restored. Marriages restored because of prayer. So, we must never stop praying. And we must never stop praying together. Number three, to achieve a balance, everyone must use their gifts. Every member of the body of Christ has a spiritual gift. That's every one here sitting today has a gift. The Lord has given you. And usually, the way you will find is by getting, in the, getting into the game. If we take a football player, he stands on the sidelines. And if the manager never puts him in the game, he will never find out what he can do. He will never know what he can do this. He, the manager, will just both stand there and guess, I think I could defend. I think I could score. I think I could tackle, and so on. So I say jump into that game. Get a place in ministry. You have a gift. Use it. And if it doesn't work for you, we will move you to another position. And another, if necessary. But you will never find your gift or your place in the church by just sitting on a bench. And lastly, to achieve the balance, churches must give together. There are at least four things we expect from those who attend church. Be here when we worship together. Get in a group and have fellowship and grow. Use your God-given gift. Find a place to serve within your church and give financially. Remember, when a church has those four things in common, they cannot be stopped. And that is the word from the Lord. So let's just pray together. Let's say the Lord's Prayer together now. Our Father, which in heart, heart in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, I will be done in earth as it is in heaven. 
Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive them those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and power and the glory, forever and ever. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the greatest sacrifice that you can give, Lord, your Son. We thank you for the body that was broken for us and the blood that was spilled. That will make us whole and our sins cleansed. So as we leave here today, Lord, we ask that you look down on us and that we can take your word out to us and tell people of the sacrifice that was given to us. In your name, Jesus Christ. Amen. Thank you.